You are not creating something from nothing. You are learning to align yourself with an aspect of your being that your senses have not known they could activate. You and that which you want to manifest into your life are one. As I wrote this book, I had the most peaceful experience of writing that I've ever enjoyed. What you are listening to right now is the result of these nine principles. The key word I kept in mind as I wrote and allowed these principles to manifest through me was the word tight. That means to me, no extraneous verbiage, no case studies, and a minimum of quotations. Each principle is explained in as straightforward a manner as I know how. Each came directly from my heart and not from my head. When I felt I had said what was needed to be said and when I had provided specific suggestions for implementing the principles, I simply stopped. You are listening to the tightest handbook I know how to devise to teach the fundamental principles for spiritual manifestation. My internal knowing is that when you practice these nine principles, you will be given guidance. You will not be alone on this journey, and you will see your desires manifest as your destiny in your daily life. Finally, you will know that your job is to say yes rather than how. I'm sending you all green lights. The first principle is called becoming aware of your highest self. Within you is a divine capacity to manifest and attract all that you need or desire. This is such a powerful statement that I suggest you listen to it over and over again and savor it before you begin this journey. Remember, within you is a divine capacity to manifest and attract all that you need or desire. Most of what we are taught to believe about our reality conflicts with this statement. I have a divine ability to manifest and attract what I need or desire. Becoming aware of your highest self does not happen through physical effort, nor can one rely solely upon supernatural techniques. What is essential is that you learn that you are both a physical body in a material world and a non-physical being who can gain access to a higher level. That higher level is within you and has reached through the stages of adult development. I present these stages with some degree of expertise because I've spent many years in each of them. They have been stepping stones to my awareness of my higher self. Each stage involved experiences that permitted me to move ahead in my thinking and my awareness. There are four stages of adult development. The first is called the athlete. The word athlete is intended as a description of the time in our adult lives when our primary identification is with our physical body and how it functions in our everyday world. This is the time when life seems impossible without a mirror and a steady stream of approval to make us feel secure. The stage of the athlete is the time in our adult development when we are almost completely identified with our performance, attractiveness, and achievements. Obviously, it is healthy to take good care of your body by treating it kindly and exercising and nourishing it in the best way your circumstances allow. Having pride in your physical appearance and enjoying compliments does not mean you are body fixated. However, if your daily activities revolve around a predetermined standard of performance and appearance, you are in the stage that I am calling here the athlete. The second stage is identified by the word the warrior. When we leave the athlete stage behind, we generally enter the stage of the warrior. This is the time when the ego dominates our lives and we feel compelled to conquer the world to demonstrate our superiority. My definition of ego is the idea that we have of ourselves as important and separate from everyone else. The ego-driven warrior objective is to subdue and defeat others in a race for the number one spot. During this stage, we are busy with goals and achievements and competition with others. This ego-dominated stage is full of anxiety and endless comparison of our successes. Trophies, awards, titles, and the accumulation of material objects record our achievements. The warrior is intensely concerned with the future and who might be in his way or interfere with his status. The third stage is identified by the term the statesperson. The statesperson stage of life is the time when we have tamed our ego and shifted our awareness. In this stage, we want to know what is important to the other person. We've begun to know that our primary purpose is to give rather than to get. The state's person is still an achiever and quite often athletic. However, the inner drive is to serve others. Authentic freedom cannot be experienced until one learns to tame the ego and move out of self-absorption. When you can let go of your own thoughts about yourself and not think of you for a long period of time, that is when you become free. 
The statesperson stage of adulthood is about service and gratefulness for all that shows up in your life. At this level, you're very close to your highest self. The primary force in your life is no longer the desire to be the most powerful and attractive or to dominate and conquer. You have entered the realm of inner peace. It is always in the service of others, regardless of what you do or what your interests are, that you find the bliss you're seeking. There is one stage even higher than the statesperson, and this can be described by the word, the spirit. When you enter this highest stage of life, regardless of your age or position, you recognize your truest essence, the highest self. When you know your highest self, you're on the way to becoming a co-creator of your entire world, learning to manage the circumstances of your life and participating with assurance in the act of creation. You become literally a manifester. The spirit stage of life is characterized by an awareness that this place called Earth is not your home. You know that you're not an athlete, a warrior, or even a statesperson, but that you are an infinite, limitless, immortal, universal, and eternal energy temporarily residing in a body. You know that nothing dies and that everything is an energy that is constantly changing. This inner infinite energy is not just in you, it is in all things and all people who are alive now and have ever lived. You begin to know this intimately. In Islam, they say, those who know themselves know their God. In Buddhism, they say, look within, you are the Buddha. In Vedanta, they say, Atman, or individual consciousness, and Brahman, universal consciousness, are one. Yoga says, God dwells within you, as you. Confucianism, heaven, earth, and human are of one body. And in the Upanishads, the ancient texts of the Hindus, by understanding the self, all this universe is known. Overcoming your conditioning in this area is crucially important. Replace thoughts about your experiences with the experience of prayer. For instance, Praying in this sense can be a sentence such as sacredness guide me now or sacred love flow through me now silently reciting instead of thinking thoughts. Prayer in this form is tilling and clearing the inner self of ego chatter so that what you desire and what desires you can grow. My own personal practice of prayer is participating in a communion with God wherein I see God within me and ask for the strength and the inner awareness to handle whatever confronts me. I keep reminding myself that heaven on earth is a choice I must make, not a place I must find. Trust, then, is the cornerstone of my praying, and with it comes the peace that is the essence of manifesting. And this idea of peace really becomes the result of this trust. You may recall that earlier I defined enlightenment as being immersed in and surrounded by peace. The more you trust in the wisdom that creates all, the more you will be trusting in yourself. The result of trusting is that an enormous sense of peace becomes available to you. As this awareness grows, you will discover that you are a more peaceful person and consequently that enlightenment becomes the way of your life. Being independent of the good opinion of others and being detached from the need to be right are two powerful indicators that your life is shifting toward a consciousness of trust in yourself and trust in God. Yet there are many people in our lives who disturb our state of peacefulness. The people whom we agree with and share similar interests with us are easy to accept and actually teach us very little. But those who can push our buttons and send us into a rage at the slightest provocation are our real teachers. Disguised as manipulative, inconsiderate, frustrating, non-understanding beings. The peace that is enlightenment means that you are not only at peace with those who share your interests and agree with you, and with strangers who come and go, but also with those master teachers who remind you that you still have some work to do on yourself. Peace occurs when your highest self is dominant in your life. When you begin to feel peace as the result of trust, you are enjoying a healthy soul. There are many things that you can do on a regular basis to make this second principle of trusting in the oneness of reality in your life. Here are a few suggestions to nurture trust in yourself and in that oneness. The first is called, begin by admitting your confusion or failures. When you're honest with yourself about every aspect of your life, you discontinue identifying with separateness. You then become ready for the insight that trust in yourself and trust in ultimate truth are one and the same. A second suggestion is to keep in mind that you cannot go to a higher ground if you're hanging on to a lower level. 
You cannot leave the physical world if you're so attached to it that you refuse to let go. The concept of trust involves surrendering to and trusting the God Force. A third suggestion is to acquire a rebellious attitude toward the philosophy that preaches a style of God as boss who is authoritarian and a benevolent tyrant. Rejection of this model does not mean that you are an atheist, but rather a believer in the true meaning of divinity. A fourth suggestion is to remember that trusting does not mean you never experience life's valleys. There will be peaks and valleys as long as you live in this physical plane. Do not abandon trust when your ego thinks things should be different than they are. It is better to embrace trust when darkness is present, knowing that light will follow. Begin to look for the lesson in the darkness, rather than cursing it. And a fifth suggestion is to take your serious problems and turn them over to God. Say something like the following. I've not been able to resolve these issues in my life. I would like to show my trust in the divine force by simply turning them over to your divine hands, which I know are also mine. And I trust that this action will lead to a resolution of these problems. A sixth suggestion is to remember that the presence of complete trust is evident in your life when what you think and feel and do are all balanced and in harmony. To say I believe in a healthy body and to practice eating in unhealthy ways dissolves trust in yourself. When you are incongruent with your thoughts, you are showing a lack of trust in the divinity that is your essence. And finally, a seventh suggestion, begin a meditation practice of contemplating the supreme principle that is beyond the pettiness of this world. Meditation is not merely making the mind think that it is meditating. Meditation is literally the embodiment of truth and trust. It is knowing that I can confront myself in a spirit of serenity and that what I seek will be attracted to me. This then is the energy of manifesting, and it comes most frequently when the mind is quiet. It is the quiet mind that comes in contact with the truth. This process of closing my eyes and becoming serene gives me the ability to tap into that source of inspiration. Inspiration, the very word comes from in spirit. This second principle of manifesting leads us to a higher place within ourselves. You will be a silent sage, moving through this material plane, knowing that you have tapped into a source of inspiration that provides you with all the sustenance you need. Indeed, you will begin to see how this earth plane is really a very big part of you, more so than you might ever have imagined. And this then becomes the subject for the third principle of manifesting. The third principle of manifesting is called, you are not an organism in an environment, you are an environed organism. One of the reasons the idea of being able to manifest is so foreign to most of us is because we have been brought up to believe that as individuals we are separate from our environment. We think it is our role to dominate it. Armed with this kind of logic, we are diminished in our ability to sense our connection to the environment. This third principle of manifesting begins with the understanding that it is absolutely impossible to describe ourselves as separate from our environment. I am coining a new word for the purpose of articulating this principle. Consider yourself an environ organism. This word signifies that there is absolutely no difference between you and your environment. You are your environment, and even more significantly for the purposes of this tape, your environment is you. Think about your own nature as an environment organism. Try thinking of the external world, your environment, as your extended body. That is, you are not separate from the external world. In this concept, it is impossible to describe yourself without including your surroundings. In fact, it is not even possible to see or hear yourself as a separate entity apart from your environment. For example, describe yourself walking, just you walking. There cannot be walking without also describing what it is you are walking upon. Without the floor or the ground, there would only be your legs moving back and forth, and of course that's not walking. Your experience of walking also includes the air you are breathing, the gravity that keeps you from floating off into space, the pebbles or carpet or sand or cement that you walk upon. And I invite you to shift your awareness away from yourself as an organism in the environment to yourself as an extension of your environment and always inseparable from it. This means that you have to think of yourself as an individual 
and as an environment simultaneously. Have you ever seen a person with a front but without a back? Have you ever seen a person with an outside but without an inside? Well, these rhetorical questions are meant to stimulate you to consider how you can be differentiated and undifferentiated at the same time, and why this is important in learning to manifest your life as you choose. In one of the most intriguing sentences in the New Testament, St. Paul addresses this process of creation. He says it this way, Things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. St. Paul is telling us that the creative energy is neither solid nor restricted. The physical world of form originates in something other than the form itself. St. Paul's words form the basis for my writing about this principle and for several of those to come in this tape. I believe they suggest how energy informs our ability to attract what we desire. St. Paul is giving us a clue about bringing our desires into the world of matter. Energy then becomes a force that we can tap into. In a film about his boyhood, Albert Einstein describes picking up a compass and watching it in fascination as the needle moved when he changed direction. He said that he became obsessed with understanding the invisible force that moved the compass needle. Where was the force located? Who controlled it? Why did it always work? Like magnetism, there is a force that has many characteristics that are quite impossible to detect with our physical senses. We call this force energy. Energy is in all things in our universe and has an impact upon objects around it with something that we describe as the power of attraction. In magnetic fields, we can easily see it at work, yet we're unable to detect the formless energy with our sensory apparatus. The force is there, attracting and repelling, and it is everywhere on our planet. If it is everywhere, then it is also within us. It seems unlikely that our senses will inform us any better than they help us comprehend how a magnetic pole works. We can see the results, but the force itself is always elusive and in motion. The essence of this fourth principle of manifesting is that we can utilize this energy because we are this energy. We can use this universal energy to bring to us objects of our desire because the same energy that is in what we desire is also in us and vice versa. It is simply a matter of alignment and will that allows us to tap into this force. Bringing things into the physical world is a process that we call creation. What we create involves the use of the same power that is in all that is created. It is only a matter of degree. There is absolutely no difference in the power that brings something from the world of waves into the world of particles and the power that brings your thoughts or mental pictures into form. I encourage you to listen to this again and again and commit it to memory. The world of spirit from which all matter derives and the world of matter comprise one harmonious whole. They are separate but always together, just like the peak of the wave and its base, separate but forming an inseparable whole. Think of manifesting as nothing more than transforming waves of possibility into particles of reality. The transforming process requires energy. This energy is invisible but is always in everything including us. Your mental pictures are related to this power of attraction. There is a power within you that allows you to form a thought or a picture. This mental picturing power is the energy of attraction that is in all creative processes. It is different in degree, but nevertheless identical with the power of attraction. This power is the very substance of life. You can't see, touch, or hear this power, but it is within you. In using this power, you are not in any way attempting to change or interfere with the laws of nature. You are fulfilling the laws. This undifferentiated power is the basis for the mysterious attraction that draws your desires to you. Think of yourself as a way that God has of particularizing. Then see your ability to formulate mental pictures as the divine creative power energizing through you. Can you see that the same creative energy that particularizes as yourself is what you use to manifest your desires. This power thrives on happiness, love, joy, contentment, and peace. The more blissful and loving you are, the more the Divine Spirit particularizes within you and the more godlike you become. It is through your thoughts, or how you use your power to create a thought, that all creative energy is attracted to you. 
If your mental pictures are of being surrounded by things and conditions that you desire, and they are rooted in joy and faith, your creative thoughts will attract these surroundings and conditions into your life. The power to even have a thought is a divine power. With this recognition of its sacredness, you form a vision or a mental picture. Finally, you hold it lovingly in place with the inner knowledge that the God force that brought everything in the universe into existence also created you. The form that this energy will take will be controlled and directed by your will or your mental picturing. It is waiting to take any direction you decide. There is a practice of mental picturing that you can master. The most important thing to remember as you practice mental picturing for the purposes of manifesting your desires is that humans never create anything. Our function is not to create, but to attract, combine, and distribute what already exists. Creations are really new combinations of already existing materials. There is one indispensable condition for the manifestation of your mental picture into the visible and concrete world. The necessity of picturing the fulfillment of your desire as if it is already accomplished on the spiritual plane. That's right. You must know within yourself that on the invisible level of your being, what you desire is already in place. You impress upon the universal mind the object of your desire, and you calmly and knowingly proceed to act upon that picture, allowing the greater intelligence and your own, which is a part of that greater intelligence, to work through you to produce the results. When you reach this level, you're in the space I think of as being in this world, but not of this world. Most people think of the spiritual world as a future occurrence that they will know after death. Most of us have been taught that the highest self is something that you cannot know as long as you're trapped in a body. However, the spirit is now. It is in you in this moment, and the energy is not something that you will ultimately come to know, but is what you are here and now. The unseen energy that was once in Shakespeare or Picasso or Galileo or any human form is also available to all of us. That is because the spirit energy does not die, it simply changes form. It can't die because it has no boundaries, no beginnings, no ends, no physical characteristic that we call form. That energy is within you. Gaining the awareness that you have a higher self that is universal and eternal will lead you to gaining access to the world more freely and to participating in the act of creation or manifesting your heart's desire. There is something called the seen and the unseen. Consider for a moment the world of form that you see around you, including your body. Who is that invisible eye inside all of the tubes and bones and arteries and skin that are your physical form? To know yourself authentically, you must understand that everything that you notice around you was and is caused by something in the world of the unseen. That something is the world of the spirit. When you look at a giant oak tree, ask yourself what caused that tree to become what it is. It started from a tiny acorn. Your logical, rational mind says that there must be something resembling treeness within that acorn. But when you open the acorn, you find nothing resembling a tree. All you find is a mass of brown stuff. If you further examine the brown stuff, you will discover distinctly acornish molecules, then atoms and electrons, then subatomic particles, until finally you find that there are no particles, only waves of energy that mysteriously come and go. Your conclusion will be that the acorn and the tree itself have a creator that is unseen, immeasurable, and called by those of us who need to classify such things the spirit or soul. This unseen world that is the source of the world of the seen is also the cause of you. In the beginning is energy, energy that has no dimensions, energy that is not in the visible world. This is our original self. It is potentiality, not an object, a future pull, if you will. It is this world of the unseen that I would like you to consider as you listen to these words. Look around you now at the world of form. Then look within and realize that the world began in the unseen dimension. Then make the big leap to the awareness that you are both of these worlds simultaneously. You are not separate from the world of the unseen any more than you could be separate from the world of the seen. You are a combination of both at all moments of your life. The problem that faces most of us in becoming manifestors and learning to manage the circumstances of our lives is that we have forfeited our ability to oscillate between the world of form and that unseen world. Have you been taught that the Creator is something outside yourself? If so, 
Your inner world, the world of the unseen, is full of notions that prohibit you from participating in the creative process. When you overcome these notions, your unseen self will be your ticket to creation in your life. What you want to practice here really is transcending your conditioning. Whether you like it or not, all of us have been conditioned to think and act in ways that have become automatic. We need to figure out how to get past this conditioning if we want to gain access to our highest self. You can be sure the ego will not take well to this kind of an effort. Asking the ego to help diminish its own significance so that you might have access to your higher self is akin to attempting to stand on your own shoulders. Ego is as unable to move aside in deference to spirit as is your eye able to see itself or the tip of your tongue able to touch the tip of your tongue. Your task thus becomes a quagmire of paradoxes. If you rely upon your ego to get past the influences of the ego, it will only strengthen its hold on you. You must figure out how to emancipate consciousness from the limitations of your mind and your body. In the ego state, you generally experience yourself as a separate entity. To move past this conditioning, you want to begin to see yourself as humanity rather than as a separate form in a body. Very simply put, if you feel that you are disconnected from the rest of humanity and truly a separate entity needing to prove yourself and compete with others, you will be unable to manifest your heart's desire. If you are able to see yourself as a part of what you desire, you will have transcended the conditioning of your ego and of all the other egos who have contributed to this process in your life. Here are a few of the conditioned thoughts that keep your ego in charge of your life and prevent you from materializing what you desire and what desires you. The first is called, I am not in charge of my life. That force is outside me. <laughs> You can change this perception. Turn your attention away from the ego-dominated thoughts about the circumstances of your life to the present moment. By consciously noticing your breath, the sounds, textures, smells, and scenes that the life force is experiencing through you. A second conditioned thought says, people cannot manifest. It is all a function of the cosmic throw of the dice. It's all just luck. Well, blaming luck or some external invisible force that controls the universe is a habit of conditioning that leads to disempowerment and ultimately, to defeat. You are the universe. It is not something outside you. You are that force which is in everything, even the things that have previously failed to show up in your life. Remember, as you think, so shall you be. If you think you can't, you're right, and that is precisely what you will see showing up in your life. A third conditioned response or thought. I have tried before and it's never worked for me. Here, the conditioned response is believing that once having tried and failed, further efforts will yield the same results. Let go of your obsession with the past and with trying, and instead remain relaxed and casual in the moment. Your past is an illusion. It is the trail that is left behind you, and a trail behind you cannot drive you today, regardless of what you choose to believe. All you have is now, and you have never tried anything. A fourth conditioned thought. Only highly evolved beings can manifest. Here again, this is the ego saying that you are separate and distinct from your spiritual teachers and others who live at the highest levels. Relinquish those thoughts and replace them with seeing yourself as connected to everyone by that unseen life force that is your divine essence. The first spiritual principle directs you to overcome your conditioning. It requires you to adopt a new attitude about yourself and then to put this attitude into daily practice. I am encouraging you to know the highest self rather than read about it, to know it in the deepest reaches of your being, and then to never doubt it again. I encourage you to follow these suggestions for developing the first principle as a permanent part of your total awareness. When you can do this without doubt or reservation, you can literally see how your inner thoughts and desires are not only within you, but are within the whole of humanity, which is abundantly boundless. As an environment organism, you are a single individual who is only a part of the picture at the same time that you contain the whole panorama. Moreover, the content of your consciousness is also hologrammatic in nature. Consciousness is the mental condition of being aware. The power of your thoughts in this hologrammatic view can be projected in such a way as to connect to all of humanity. Your thoughts are literally connected to the thoughts of everyone else as are your emotions, your desires, your total inner world. 
You can learn to use this connection to nurture your own divinity and therefore, by definition, the divinity of all of humanity. The nature of a hologram and the nature of you as an environ organism are one and the same. The Bhagavad Gita, the holy book of the Hindus, summarizes the point of view as profoundly as I've ever heard. Listen to these words. He who sees that the Lord of all is ever the same in all that is, immortal in the field of mortality, he sees the truth. And when a man sees that the God in himself is the same God in all that is, he hurts not himself by hurting others. Then he goes indeed to the highest path. The key phrase in this profound passage is, in all that is. This includes you and me and everything that is. It is you. You are not separate from it. Here are a few suggestions for beginning to implement this principle, this third principle of manifesting, which says that you are not separate from your environment. First, make a conscious effort to check yourself when you begin to think in ways that reflect separateness. Imagine yourself as a part of all that you see and make an internal attempt to project the energy of your thoughts into all that is alive on the planet. This inner practice will help you to embrace the concept of you as an environment organism rather than an organism in an environment. Secondly, contemplate the energy that is your life force. Forget about your body and your thoughts and focus attention on your energy, which is also known as chi or prana. See if you can sense it objectively and also try to do the same thing with the energy of someone close to you. Watch that person and forget about their body. Center your attention on the idea that you share the same energy and so you are the same person at that energy level. Thirdly, trust in the wisdom of your feelings. If you feel it, it is true for you. When you trust your feelings, you trust the energy that is the life force of the universe. And fourth, practice being gentle, respectful, and loving toward the life force in all things. In other words, behave as if the God in all life really mattered. The energy of love is sent out into the universe and connects with the same loving essence that is in all things. Fifth, determine that you will spend some time each day alone and in silence meditating on this principle. Repeat the principle over and over as a silent mantra. I am not an organism in an environment. I am an environment organism. By repeating these words to yourself, you will eventually begin to project this reality outward. And sixth, make the spaces of your life as sacred as possible. In your living space, bless all that surrounds you and fill your space with the life that plants, flowers, and animals bring. Spend time contemplating your living space as a holy place. The more you bring your environment alive with sacred thoughts and feelings, the more you will feel spiritually connected. The Sufi poet Rumi, almost a millennium ago, wrote a poem that reflects this consciousness. I'd like to share it here with you. It's called The Seed Market. He says, Can you find another market like this where with one rose you can buy hundreds of rose gardens? Where for one seed you get a whole wilderness? For one weak breath, the divine wind? You've been fearful of being absorbed in the ground or drawn up by the air. Now your water bead lets go and drops into the ocean where it came from. It no longer has the form it had but it's still water, the essence is the same. This giving up is not a repenting, it's a deep honoring of yourself. When the ocean comes to you as a lover, marry at once, quickly for God's sake. Don't postpone it, existence has no better gift. No amount of searching will find this. A perfect falcon for no reason has landed on your shoulder and become yours. A seventh suggestion is to become aware of how your judgments prevent you from connecting to whatever you are judging. A judgment is a definition of yourself as separate from that which you are judging. Remember that it is possible to look out on the world and not condemn it, to have absolutely no judgment or interpretation of it, but to just allow it to be. And an eighth suggestion. Have fun with the idea of yourself as a hologram. If you remember that you are a tiny piece of humanity reflected in your own little image and personality, then you have a green light to reflect the humanity that you would like in your world. You are one tiny bit of a six billion or so piece hologram, and you reflect all of those six billion pieces at every given moment of your life. This is the third principle of spiritual manifestation. 
we are all simultaneously our own beings and all that is outside us as well. We cannot ever separate ourselves from our environment while we are in a physical body. Knowing this puts us in touch with the energy of attraction that is the subject matter of the fourth principle. The fourth principle of spiritual manifestation says, you can attract to yourself what you desire. The central notion of manifesting is the understanding that you have within yourself the ability to attract the objects of your desire. Now this may still seem to you to be out of your power, but if you have understood the previous three principles, then you're beginning to know that this power is within you. Being able to attract your desires may seem more likely when you consider how things move from the world of the formless into the world of the form. The first suggestion. Think of this definition of enlightenment. To be immersed in and surrounded by peace. Your highest self only wants you to be at peace. It does not judge, it doesn't compare or demand that you defeat anyone or be better than anyone. You know your highest self by listening to the voice that only wants you to be at peace. That's what enlightenment is. A second suggestion. Go beyond the restrictions of the physical plane. The purpose of the highest self is to assist you in this effort. You do this by creating an inner sanctuary that is yours and yours alone. Go to the silent inner retreat as often as you can and let go of all attachments to the external world of the ego. As you go to this sanctuary, a light will be born within you that you will come to know and respect. This light is your connection to the energy of manifestation. Here's a third suggestion. Refuse to defend yourself to anyone or anything on the earth plane. This is the challenge of the highest self. Use your inner light for your alignment and allow those who disagree with that perspective to have their own points of view. You are at peace. You never explain and you refuse to flaunt your energy. You know, and that is enough for you. And here's a fourth and final suggestion. Surrender and trust in the wisdom that created you. This trust is your corner of freedom and it will always be yours. Your highest self is not just an idea that sounds lofty and spiritual. It is a way of being. It is the very first principle that you must come to understand and embrace as you move toward attracting to you that which you want and need for this parentheses in eternity that you know is your life. The second principle is called trusting yourself, is trusting the wisdom that created you. Learning to trust may be difficult in the beginning. It will be an exercise in futility if you rely upon your mind to create trust. The mind attempts to come up with intellectual answers by using proofs, logic, and theoretical reasoning. In contrast, the method of the heart, focused on spiritual understanding, is an intuitive recognition of the value of love. The heart trusts the inner wisdom that it feels and spontaneously knows, whereas the mind demands scientific evidence before it will trust. When the mind seeks corroboration through specific proofs as an aid to spiritual understanding, it is encroaching into an area far more suited to the heart. For this reason, it is necessary to trust what the heart knows. Without total trust, it is impossible to know the miracles of the higher self and become a manifester. This means cultivating a harmony between mind and heart, and for most of us this means terminating the intellect's domination. It is with this surrendering process that trust begins to flourish, replacing doubt. Here are two theories describing our place in nature. I think you will agree that the first theory illuminates why mistrust of ourselves and our divine abilities is so deeply rooted. The first theory is called nature as a mechanism. In this mechanistic view of nature, everything is an artifact made by a boss who has many different names. In the Western view, the boss is called God. This God is often depicted as a white bearded male who roams around the sky creating the natural world. The world is a construct and God the constructor. This biblical God is paternal, authoritarian, beneficent, and, in many ways, tyrannical. He keeps track of all things and knows precisely what everyone does and when his laws are being broken. One of the operatives of this theory of nature is the idea of punishment for one's sins. This God, dash father or Godfather, holds us accountable for transgressions. All subjects are considered born with a stain of sin as a part of their nature and are therefore untrustworthy. This makes many people feel estranged. Once convinced that you are untrustworthy and basically a sinner, you're quite lost. 
You cannot even maintain trust in God because of the basic mistrust of yourself. And not trusting in that God may be breaking one of his own laws. It's a no-win situation. This theory of nature is absolutely incompatible with the second principle of manifesting. You cannot tune into the power and energy of the universe to create and attract an abundant life if that energy and power is outside of yourself. There's a second theory of nature that I call nature as spontaneous and non-judging. In this spontaneous view, God is universal intelligence flowing through everything. Nature is an unforced unfolding of life forms and there is no boss. Rather than learning to manage and control the natural world, the impulse is to trust it. Human beings are an aspect of this God and are therefore carriers of divinity. Generally, in this theory, human beings are considered the highest level of life form. Trusting this most evolved natural human includes trusting the paradox of behavior described as good and bad, selfish and unselfish, or greedy and generous, in the same manner as we respect other life forms by trusting their processes. The second principle directs us to develop an inner knowing so that the natural process of what desires us is what we desire. Think of yourself as a consciousness being played out by God, just as a wave is a part of the ocean that is being played out by the ocean itself. The unseen divine energy is the ocean that your waveform is a part of. You can call it God, ocean, or anything else. This is a profoundly exquisite realization because with it, you bring to your consciousness the inner awareness that you are actually in all things. This leads to miraculous manifestations. You begin to consider what it means to be in all things at one time. Authentic trust is only available through the knowing heart. When you enter this trusting space, everything will come to you that belongs to you because you've created the inner capacity to receive it. The irony is that what you wish to receive is a part of you. This can be a troublesome concept to grasp because of the ego's attachment to being separate and special. Nothing in your rational mind could convince you that water is made of two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. It appears to be a fluid that flows and has nothing to do with gases. But when we subject water to scrutiny, its constituent elements become manifest. And so it is with the idea of being in all things at once. If you truly trust in this notion, you realize that everything that you perceive as missing in your life is a part of the same energy that you are. Manifesting becomes the art of bringing to yourself that which is already you. I have deliberately chosen not to use many quotations in this program. But I want to emphasize that every spiritual master and all of the saints and teachers and gurus or priests throughout history have espoused similar advice. This perennial philosophy connects all humanity from tribal and ancient to civilized and present times. It is the message that God is within and outside every living thing and that there is a world we are a part of that is not subject to the changing world of time and space that we presently are a part of. Since it is everywhere, it is not only within you, it is you. The meaning of this is that God is not to be found so much as discovered within yourself. The statement, Thou art the path, is more than an ecclesiastical admonition. It is a statement of your reality. And then you must consider prayer and what it means to understand this concept of trust. In the matter of prayer, it seems that we often view God as a gigantic vending machine in the sky who's going to grant us our wishes when we put in the proper tokens in the form of prayers. We expect to insert prayers, then pull on the knob and hope that God will dispense the goodies. The God vending machine becomes the object of our veneration. We tell the machine how good it is and how much we worship it and expect it to be good to us in return. The basic premise here is that God is outside us and therefore what we need and want is also outside of us. If we believe that we are separate from God, the vending machine approach to prayer reinforces and deepens that belief. I prefer to promote the idea of prayer in its essence as a communion with God. What we seek in prayer is the experience of coexisting with God. Prayer is our communication of readiness for the desires of this sacred energy to manifest through our human form. Therefore, the true experience of God does not change or alter God, but it changes us. It heals our sense of separation. If we are not changed by prayer, we have denied ourselves the opportunity to know the wisdom that created us. 
The search for happiness outside ourselves rekindles the idea that we are not whole and relegates prayer to the status of a plea to a boss God. We are then asking for favors rather than seeking a manifestation of our invisible, inspired self. Prayer at the spiritual level I'm talking about is not asking for something any more than the attempt to become a manifestor is asking for something to show up in your life. What I call authentic prayer is inviting divine desire to express itself through myself. It expresses my experience of oneness with the divine energy. This may sound like a radical or even blasphemous notion, but is the source of all spiritual traditions. Here's a few examples. In Christianity, they say, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And then from John 14, verse 20, On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. You have the power within you to attract to yourself all that you could ever want. This is the central theme of Manifest Your Destiny, which is unlike any book or program that I have ever previously produced. I have chosen to write and talk about manifesting because I've been drawn to it, rather than because it is the next logical step in the progression of books and programs that I have produced over the past two decades. As I began writing, I felt a kind of humility, along with a feeling of arrogance. These feelings created questions such as, who am I to write about this capacity to manifest? Isn't this territory reserved for divine beings? What gives me the authority to tell others about an ability that is unique to the gods? These questions swirled around inside of me and I was motivated by more self-doubt than I like to acknowledge. And then I did what I have encouraged my readers to do in my most recent book, Your Sacred Self. I banished all my doubts and I began listening to the inner voices that kept telling me I would receive the guidance I needed and that I would not be alone in this project. In other words, I surrendered and went deep within in my meditations and allowed myself to release all fear and doubt and simply to trust. It was at this time, as I was considering writing these principles and producing this program, even though I had no clear idea what they were precisely, nor in what order they should be presented, that I received a message from a teacher named Guruji, to whom this book is dedicated. Sri Guruji instructed me to listen to a tape on the power of manifesting and to practice in my own life what I was being taught, and then to present this manifesting technique to the world. I began to practice the manifestation principles in my daily meditations, just as they are presented in this book and in this program. I experienced astonishing results almost immediately. A few months later, I produced a compact disc and a cassette tape titled Meditations for Manifesting, and thousands of people began to use these principles and practice the manifesting meditation technique. The results have been mind-shattering. I've heard stories of manifesting job promotions, having a baby, which was supposedly an impossibility, selling a home that had been on the market for years without potential buyers, and other stories of prosperity and healing that border on being miracles. I know that these principles work. Their miraculous power is not based on a belief, it is a knowing. I know that we have a divine power that has gone untapped primarily because of our conditioning. I know that you can begin to manifest for yourself virtually anything that you're capable of conceiving if you practice these nine principles studiously. Make an effort to listen to these principles and begin to apply them in your daily life without judging them based on what you have been conditioned to believe about yourself as a person who is, quote, only human, unquote, and therefore limited. What you desire is of central importance, though you may never before have even thought of desire and higher spiritual awareness as compatible concepts. Yet the process of creating begins first with a desire. Your desires, cultivated as seeds of potential on the path of spiritual awareness, can blossom in the form of the freedom to have these desires in peace and harmony with your world. Giving yourself permission to explore this path is allowing yourself the freedom to use your mind to create the precise material world that matches your inner world. That inner world is the catalyst for determining your physical world experiences. You will have to abandon the idea that you are powerless over the circumstances of your life. You will need to shift out of the group mentality that says you are incapable of manifesting. Examine the pressures and beliefs which reflect the thinking of your immediate family, your extended family, your community, your religious groupings, your ethnic grouping, your educational business groupings, or any of a multitude of specialized units of people. Determine the areas of your life that are jammed up with the teachings of those mindsets, causing your personal evolution to be slowed down because what you truly desire or believe is not getting any energy from your unique individuality. 
As you unplug your circuits from those external forces, you will see the speed of your evolvement increase drastically. If you hear a voice behind your eyeballs that says, move forward, you no longer wait for everyone else to make a move forward before you take your first step. When you cultivate the inner conviction to manifest from the world of the unseen into the material world, you understand that there is a universal God force that is in all things in the universe. There is not a separate God for each individual, each plant, each animal, each mineral. They are all one. The same God force that is within you and causes you to think and breathe is simultaneously in everyone and everything else as well. There is no place that it is not. Consequently, that which you perceive to be missing from your life also contains the same God force or universal intelligence that is within you. Manifesting then becomes doing nothing more than bringing into form a new aspect of yourself. The nature of the physical world is essentially that of waves. Each wave of energy that makes up a physical mass has a crest or a peak and a nadir or a valley. These tops and bottoms of the waves are always easy to identify as separate, yet they are always together. You can never ever get a bucket full of peaks and observe them independent of their corresponding valleys. This is the fundamental feature of nature. Your front always has a back, your inside always has an outside. And now you must extend this understanding outward as well. You are distinct just like the tops of the waves that make up your natural physical self, but you are irrevocably connected to the outer world just as that bottom of the wave always has a top. When you begin to see this simple truth, mystical experiences of manifesting also open up to you as a genuine possibility. You see, you're either pushing nature around or you're seeing it as yourself, one or the other. When we think of ourselves as distinct from our environment, we take on a posture of exercising control over it. We destroy forests and swamps and mountains and rivers and wildlife or anything else that obstructs profit and convenience over something we call advancing civilization. We defend these activities without understanding that we are also destroying ourselves. As we have seen, we cannot be described independent of our environment any more than our outside can be described without our inside. When we can respect that which appears to be external to us, we will build to live in harmony with, rather than in control over, our environment. In our personal lives, recognizing nature as ourselves opens up an entirely new world of manifestation. Your new faith will no longer permit you to see anything as separate. The separateness will always be there, just as the peak of the wave is separate from the trough. But they remain inseparable, even while separate. You will have fused the dichotomy that prevents you from putting this connective energy to work. You will begin to view yourself as an organic part of this world, rather than as a separate entity in this world. And then you'll see yourself as an organic part of this world. There's a popular belief that we come into this world. <laughs> Thus we are continuously embracing the idea that who we are and where we come from are two different worlds. The essence of the third spiritual principle for manifesting your destiny is that there is no separation and rather than coming into this world as a construction project, you actually grow out of it. You are a result of what the universe is doing on a conscious level, just as a wave is what the ocean is doing and a plum is what the plum tree is doing. The intelligence that is you, unseen as it may be, is you in every stage of your creation and life experience, and it is also the same in every other person, as well as in all things in our physical world. Notice that everyone breathes the same air, walks on the same ground, and thinks as an organism just like you. You are indeed connected to all of these beings. It is not an accident that someone living in a distant country with different outward physical characteristics and a separate language could die and donate their liver or kidney or cornea to you and it would accommodate the life force flowing in you. A profoundly important Native American saying is, no tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. Imagine the result of such behavior by the tree. The tree and all of its parts would die from such an absurdity. Yet that is precisely what we do when we see ourselves as divided from all of the other people who are being peopled from the same divine intelligence. When you know that you grow out of this world just as an apple does from an apple tree, then you identify with the spiritual essence. It is in identification with this inner essence that you make your connection to everything else. And it is with this connection that you begin to attract your desires to your physical world. I want you to gain a clear sense of how you are actually growing out of this world. 
You are not a momentary flash of embodied consciousness between two eternal blacknesses. You are an essence that is eternally growing in this world. A world in which the spirit and the manifestation of that spirit appear to be different to the senses, and indeed they are, but they are also connected. This awareness is crucial as you proceed along the manifesting path. That power is in you, but it's not yours alone. The power and the magic of this world cannot be reserved for the exclusive use of anyone, including you. It is available at all times. However, it does not belong to anyone. What you are doing as an environ organism is making contact with an energy that is beyond the dualism of the earth plane, and yet is connected to it at the same time, separate but distinct. You are a holistic being with both non-dualistic energy and the energy of the physical plane at your disposal. As a holistic being, you shatter the illusion of your separateness and reveal your connection to everything. This empowers you in a way that the ego-driven self could never contemplate. One of the ways to understand this is to see yourself as a hologram. A hologram is a three-dimensional photographic image obtained with laser beams. The unique thing about a hologram is that one small segment contains the entire picture. When one tiny piece of the hologram is broken off and projected, it shows an image of the entire object. The hologram is a perfect representation for you as an environment organism. Your environment includes everyone alive and dead, and you can draw their energy to you because, from a hologrammatic viewpoint, they are you. You are one little physical image that reflects all of humanity when projected spiritually upon the cosmic screen. Each and every one of us is the whole of humanity. You cannot escape this conclusion. Human beings are the same everywhere. We share the emotions of fear, love, hate, and jealousy. We also share our life-giving blood, intermingling it with the survival of those who need it, and we have the same internal organs and thoughts. When you perceive yourself in the hologram that is humanity, you connect on an energy level to everyone else in your environment. An environ organism most truly is a reflection of it all, and this energy that you share is shared by all. This awareness gives you the option to tap into this universal energy anywhere, at any time, by metaphorically projecting yourself to reflect the whole. You abandon all fear and return to the affairs of your life, assured that the necessary conditions will soon come into view or are already there. The key is to repeat the mental pictures until the truth of what you are affirming resonates within you without an ounce of doubt. And there will be times when it appears that it isn't working. If your picture doesn't manifest in the time span that you've designated, relax and retreat to your knowing that it is already in place in the spiritual realm. Time is simply not a recognizing feature of the all-creating wisdom. However. You will find it impossible to manifest if you are visualizing without an authentic will that is sufficiently steady to overcome any contrary idea or lack of faith in your own divine connection to God. And here we must talk about the value of secrecy. When we speak to others about our efforts to manifest, our power is weakened. In general, when we describe these activities, it is because the ego has entered the picture. This kind of approach considerably dissipates our power of attraction. Maintain privacy concerning your own unique powers to attract to you what you desire. In order to tap into the extraordinary energy and use it in the co-creation process, it must remain yours and yours alone. The moment you discuss it with anyone who is alive today is the moment it diminishes. The higher energy, which is infinite, must create its own vehicle for manifesting, and it does so in the privacy of those vehicles. We are talking here about a vital force, a God force. Let's look at the nature of this vital force. It's difficult to comprehend a force that we cannot see, or touch, or hear, or smell, and still know that it exists. It is similar to electricity. You plug in your appliance and you cannot see, touch, smell, or hear anything happening, but your electric hairdryer responds when you press the on switch. This is a good way to think of the vital force that is the all-creating God force as well. It is invisible, electrical in nature, always flowing, and always attracted to that which plugs into its source. A second characteristic of the life force energy is that it is always expanding, and it is unlimited in supply. The nature of the universe is abundance. It 
goes on beyond our concepts of beginnings and endings and boundaries. When we think we have it categorized and locked into a time-space boundary, it expands beyond our awareness, almost as if it must move further away from observation. You are an aspect of that force, and therefore you, too, are flowing, ever-expanding, and unlimited. It is your nature to be able to attract, to expand, to be unlimited. This force is in you, and this force is outside you. This force is you. By knowing the nature of this force and seeing yourself as a divine expression of it, and by going within to the power that permits you to picture a desire, and then tapping that power with a private, loving, cheerful knowing, you are on your way to using this vital force in ways that were unavailable to you with your conditioned view of yourself. Let's look at some ideas for putting this principle into work in your life. When first arising in the morning, take a few moments to be alone and ask yourself, how did the conditions of my life that I would like to change first come about? How can I facilitate making conscious contact with my unlimited, invisible source of energy? You'll soon realize that the conditions of your life have been manifested by you, even though you are not conscious of bringing them about. Your thoughts and mental pictures of lack and scarcity and self-absorption and authoritarianism and illness and guilt and worry and all of these have been put into the universal spirit and have manifested in your life. You can hasten your conscious contact by radiating a totally new kind of mental picture while applying this fourth principle. And then secondly, explore the possibility that the reason you believe that life is limiting is because you have assumed limitation to be in your life. Does your view of life include the natural creative process reproducing within yourself? Stay in this place within and you will know conscious contact with the divine, all-creating intelligence.